pleasure to be here today and really glad to hear that you guys have all been thinking about the kind of the shift and, and the fact that it's not really about information, it's about what we do with it. Because that's very much where my mind went when I started to think about um, what I was going to talk about here today and how I was going to frame some of the things that we've been doing at BitTorrent. So the information age is sort of broadly what we've been sort of told that this is that we're going through. Um, and I, I think that's correct, right? I mean, we're sort of shifting from the industrial revolution and industrial age to an age based around information. But it seems to me that it's not really about the stuff. It's, a, it's really about what we do with it. And it's about how we think about sharing it. And at this particular point in time, that's becoming uh, this particular last, sort of last few months has become really, really uh, a, a really, really interesting point that I know lots of people are thinking about. So just sort of to explain what I mean, like we've had several different information technologies, and we, we've decided to they, they've allowed us to do things in different ways. So telephone was a one-to-one -one network, and then we had radio and TV, and those were broadcast. Those were one-to-many. Um, and for both those, we developed business models, and they changed the world in, in lots of really great ways. Um, and then the internet came along, which was a many-to-many -many network. And the way we've thought about the internet um, as we've had the internet up until now is as, uh, as the web, as a place, as a, a series of connected places, IP addresses. The web, is, the web is a network of places that you can go. And that's an interesting thing to think about, because that's not necessarily the only way to think about the internet, we're starting to see um, the limitations and some of the some of the sort of scarier things of, of having places and addresses and central points in the internet where people can control things or look at things belonging to other people or, or snoop on other people's con communications. All of these subjects and themes have been coming up over the last few weeks um, in various guises. But, th but this isn't the only way to think about the internet. And I, I want to talk about the way that we think about the internet a bit torrent, because it it's slightly different. So the way we think about the internet and the way um, a, lo a lot of people, Van Jacobson at Park and uh, lots of different people at MIT and, and other places, are very into this idea of something called content-centric networking, which is an internet that's not about where, but about what. It's not about the place, but it's about the content itself. And the idea is you don't, if you don't have a place, then you don't, you don't have firewalls. You can, you can hard code free speech into society, um, which I believe is, is probably a good thing to do. So the idea of a many-to-many -many network with no places, um, a content-centric network, as it's called, is, is a theoretical concept. The only real-life concept, uh, the real-life working example of a content-centric network that all the academics working on this point to is BitTorrent. And the way BitTorrent works is there are no servers because everybody who uses BitTorrent, the 170 million people who use BitTorrent every month, their laptops are the servers. There's no server farms. There's no big central infrastructure. And that means, that, that means several things. The, the thing that's really powerful about that is this network can grow exponentially. The more people using it, the faster it gets. The more people sharing a piece of information across BitTorrent, the, the faster it is to upload and download that, that piece of information. So it's a really, really interesting technology. It's the closest we've ever got to creating a perpetual motion machine. It's, it's fascinating. But it hasn't been portrayed that way over the last 10 years. If you think about what people talk about when they talk about BitTorrent, it's chaos, it's anarchy. It's usually the word piracy. People think about BitTorrent and they think about the Pirate Bay or ISO Hunt or downloading movies illegally. Um, the reason that that's something that people think about is BitTorrent's an open source protocol, and lots of different people use it for lots of different lots of different reasons. So every time Facebook updates Facebook, they use BitTorrent to push that update. Same thing with Twitter, Wikipedia, Etsy. Um, the Large Hadron Collider uses BitTorrent to to move around large data sets. Same things with the Human Genome Project. None of those guys have to ask BitTorrent Incorporates, Incorporated's permission to do that because it's open source, because it's been a public, in the public domain for um, 12 years now. Um, and the Pirate Bay don't have to ask our permission either. If we shut down BitTorrent, the company, tomorrow, Facebook, the Pirate Bay, and the Large Hadron Collider could all continue to use BitTorrent. But BitTorrent's not for piracy. It's actually, it's actually a really, really useful technology. It was designed to replace HTTP, 
Um, and I'm proud to say it actually kind of, it's starting to. So the BitTorrent protocol moves more information now than HTTP. So every single piece of information on the web, if you take YouTube and Facebook and iTunes and combine them, they move less information every day than the BitTorrent protocol. Our founder, Bram Cohen, created the BitTorrent protocol to do exactly that. He looked at the web and was like, this is great for moving tiny pieces of text and, and pictures, but when we start moving around massive, massive files, and more importantly, when machines start moving massive files to each other without even talking to us, then we're going to need something much, much more powerful than HTTP, and that's why he created BitTorrent, and it seems to be working. Um, but people think of us as a piracy company because this is how disruptive technologies come into the world. Um, this is something I've thought about before I was at BitTorrent. I wrote a book called The Pirate's Dilemma and did a lot of research into how, how disruptive media is always kind of, it always is first portrayed as something that's gonna destroy everything. So take this guy, this is a, a guy, one of the first kind of music industry pirates. His name was Thomas Edison and he invented this machine here which is a phonographic record player. When he invented it, musicians looked at this machine that es essentially played uh, exact copies of, of live performances, which is what they did to earn money. And they could not understand, that, uh, neither could Edison at the time, they were both uh, came to a sort of, uh, you know, had a massive argument for years about the fact that this machine was gonna put musicians out of business. People, musicians were literally calling Edison a pirate until they developed the idea of a record label and royalties and Edison Records was born. And they kind of figured it all out and that's how the record industry was born. Edison went on to invent um, filmmaking technology and, and his business model for that was, was let's charge a license fee to every, every filmmaker who's gonna use this technology. Well, lots of filmmakers didn't like that because the license fee was very high. So this is one guy who didn't like that who Edison thought was a pirate. His name was William. Uh, William was a filmmaker based in New York and he wanted to make films, but he couldn't make them in New York because Edison's lawyers were everywhere and they would shut him down if he made a film without paying the license fee. So William and a bunch of other filmmakers actually fled New York and um, they moved to this, this town close to the Mexican border on the West Coast, which was still then the, very much the, the Wild West. And they started this community of pirate filmmakers and the idea was that they were close enough to the Mexican border that if they got word that Edison's lawyers were coming out from New York, they could all, they could all go and hide out over the border and wait till those guys had gone. Um, and they beat Edison, they, they kept running around him and this town of pirate filmmakers is still there today. It's called Hollywood. And uh, that guy William's second name was Fox. So if you go back through the history of disruptive media formats and disruptive new technologies, there's always piracy. The first decade is always this like, oh my God, this is gonna destroy the world. And then suddenly people start to say, hang on a second, maybe we can do something interesting with this. But I don't wanna, I, I mean, I'm, I don't wanna sort of not acknowledge the fact that people are using the BitTorrent protocol for piracy. So this is a story that came out a few weeks ago. The finale of Game of Thrones was downloaded 5.2 million times by people using the Pirate Bay. Um, that's crazy, that's, uh, that's a problem, right? That's, that's piracy, um, a lot of people think. One of the producers of Game of Thrones actually said he wasn't sure if this was a problem and maybe this was helping. But let's just say, for argument's sake, this is a problem and this is something that we, as a society, need to think about and, and hopefully fix. Um, I, I think we're getting towards that. I mean, the thing that we've sort of seen and the argument I made in the Pirates' Dilemma was the best way to fight piracy isn't to like just sort of stamp it out in an endless game of whack-a-mole, but it's to figure out the value that piracy is creating, the kind of this grey market, and copy that value in, the, in a legitimate way and, and deliver that to consumers in a way that makes sense for them. And if, and if you can beat the pirates through convenience or a better experience, a lot of times you'll win out. And we're starting to see some really, really great examples of that. So, so Facebook was based on a file sharing service called Wirehog that, that Mark Zuckerberg was working on. If you look at the architecture of iTunes or Spotify, they look a lot like Napster. If you look at YouTube, I mean, YouTube was all piracy when it started. Netflix is, is very much a streaming site that's based on the architecture of pirate streaming sites. All of, these, all of these sites, which are essentially walled gardens where good transactions can happen with legitimate content, were all based on, on business models started by internet pirates a decade ago, which is, is pretty interesting. There's, a, there's kind of a problem with this architecture though, and I don't know if any of you have spotted it, I tried to sort of draw it so it was easy to understand, but what we're doing is, is good. Like all of these things are fantastic and I'm a big fan of all of these services and use them all. But this is kind of a broadcast model. 
And I'm really glad that DK brought up that, that Peter Drucker quote, that, that culture eats strategy for lunch, because this is strategy, what's happening over here. This is create a store the way that we've always done it, create something centralized, and then broadcast it over here. The problem is this over here is culture. And once you get the content from out of these places, it's going to keep spreading around here because this is a many-to-many -many network designed to infinitely make copies of everything that we ever create. And that's just a cultural fact now, now no matter how many wall gardens we build and how good the walls are. So there's something going on there that's, that, that's it, it's not quite perfect. And we look at this at BitTorrent and we, we always think, well, how can we build a distributed solution, a decentralized solution to this problem? Because there's other things going on here that, that, that are starting to, people are starting to respond to. So if you talk to filmmakers about Netflix or YouTube or musicians about Spotify, some of them like it, some of them don't. Because the fact is there's not one business model for digital content anymore. The, the Spotify business model or the YouTube business model, they may work for some people, they're not gonna work for everyone because there's a different business model for every single piece of digital content out there because it's really about culture, it's about the creator and their fans and how they connect over here. That's always gonna be different. So you're starting to, I, I hear a lot of complaints. I work with lots of people in the entertainment industries. Um, one friend of mine, he's the, the manager of Lincoln Park, and he told me about um, the first email he got from Facebook after the IPO. Um, so Lincoln Park have 50 million plus fans on, on Facebook, and they wanted to message them all, all at once for the first time ever. And uh, they, they asked Facebook how they might go about doing that. And Facebook said, well, yeah, you can do that. It's absolutely fine. It's going to cost you $250,000. And they thought, well, hang on a sec. We just spent years and tons of money and did all this stuff to get 50 million people into Facebook. And now, now we've got to pay every time we talk to them. And it's the, the, the thing that uh, my friend Aaron Ray said to me from the collective was he was tired of building houses in other people's backyards. And that's kind of what's going on over here. So there's definitely a business problem with this approach. Um, you know, Like I said, all of these things are good. But there's more work to be done. There's a distributed solution that we haven't quite hit on yet. There's another problem with doing stuff like this. Um, I mean, it's the old way of doing things. It's us applying the old business model to a new culture, or the old strategy to a new culture. So it's content in a store, which is how we've always done things in the real world. But it's not necessarily how things work over here. The other problem with putting things in one place and trusting lots of people with your information is that you don't know what they're doing with that or who's looking at that. And I don't want to talk too much about PRISM because I'm, I'm sure you've all been thinking about this a lot, but that was a big wake-up call. I, a bit on, we always think about servers and distributed technologies and you know this stuff's great, but most people don't know what a server is. Well, a month ago, lots of people suddenly found out what a server was and why they might have to worry about that. The thing is, we don't need servers. We don't need to necessarily build an internet this way. And we don't need to do it, and perhaps shouldn't do it from a business point of view. We certainly shouldn't do it from a civil liberties point of view. So we started to think about, well, OK, is there a different way that you could do something to help the content industries? Because right now, we really want to help those guys. They, there seems like there's a, there's a huge gap still that we could fill, and there's a distributed solution that, that might be interesting. So instead of thinking about putting content in stores, which is very much a sort of get everything into one centralized location, we start to think, what if you put stores in content? What if you actually put the transaction or the interaction that a creator wants to have with a consumer inside the piece of content itself? Because the content's going to get shared. That's the culture. So this is a strategy that hopefully might fit with that. So we started thinking about that. And it's like, yeah, if, if someone's sharing an opportunity for an artist to connect with a fan in a legitimate way, the more fans share it, the more opportunity that creates for the artist. And we started doing experiments um, with, with this idea, and we've been working with filmmakers and musicians, DJs, bands, all kinds of creators, authors for the last, uh, last two years, working on this new prototype where we just put a piece of content with an interaction in the file in front of the, the 170 million people who use BitTorrent every month and just say, hey, do you want to check this out? Like, what do you think? 
And we've seen some really, really interesting things happen. We've seen tons of great interactions. We've seen authors hit the New York Times bestseller list. We've seen filmmakers sell out um, movie theaters in 15 cities across the states. We've seen artists get millions and millions of downloads um, and collect millions of email addresses, make real money from people using BitTorrent because there was a different interaction happening in a slightly different way. And we're now turning, we're now building a product based on these experiments we're doing called the BitTorrent Bundle. And the bundle is the first major change that we've ever, ever made to the torrent file format. And what it basically does is there's a gate inside the file. It's not DRM, it's not something that can't be hacked. And these things will be hacked, absolutely, just like every piece of content from Amazon or iTunes. You can't change the culture. But the idea is if you put a piece of content in front of a BitTorrent user in a way that feels organic and natural to them, and if they feel like there's something's coming directly from the artist, we've seen millions upon millions of BitTorrent users actually, actually reward artists for their content. So the idea is you could maybe have something before the gate that makes it worth sharing. So maybe it's a movie trailer, and then if you enter your email address, you get the extended trailer and a bunch of really cool content behind the gate. Email addresses are really, really useful for those of you who are not in the business of marketing content. Most artists will tell you these days an email address is more valuable than a 99 cent sale on iTunes because that's a direct connection with a fan. That's not a Facebook like that you might have to pay for. That's a fan that you own for life. You have their email address and they've given you permission to talk to them. It's really, really valuable. So email is one thing that you could collect through a bundle. Um, but it doesn't have to be just email. It could be, OK, well, if you enter your email, you get this. But once 50,000 fans enter 50,000 emails, everybody gets something else. The file will keep unlocking the more people interact with it. The bundle is essentially a social object that, that changes as people do things to it and as it travels around the internet. Um, we're working towards um, a pay gate. So one of the gates will just be, OK, well, you don't have to give us your email to to go and get emailed when this movie's out in theaters, maybe you just pay us eight bucks and you get to watch this movie right now. That's something else we're working on. Um, and, and maybe there could be a second gate where, OK, when this movie makes X amount of dollars or pounds, something really, really cool happens. So th the reason we're building all these different types of gates into the file is, again, we don't, we're not a content company. We're a technology company. And what we've learned from working with with creators and artists is there's, there's all these different business models. And the best thing we can do is give them a file format that they can configure themselves to work with their fan base in the way that they know makes sense for them. So ultimately, when we release the bundle, the bundle publishing platform, which will be Q4 of this year, it's going to be up to you what you put either in front of this gate or before this gate and how fans open it and how many gates there are and, and what you do with it. And, the thing I'm really excited about this here is, is not that you know, someone's going to make a million dollars selling stuff through a bundle. I'm sure they will. Um, I'm really excited about the crazy things that, that nobody can see coming. Um, I, I won't tell you the name of the artist, but one of the most famous artists in the world emailed us the other week, like bizdev at bittorrent.com, just said, hey, I am. I'm this guy, and uh, I'm really, really excited about this bundles thing. I want you to, I want you to come down and meet me at my house in Hollywood and um, talk to me about how we're going to release my new album. So we flew down and, and, and we met with this artist in this, this giant house, and I went with, you know, all these numbers and very prepared about how much money we could make this artist because that's what I thought they wanted to hear. And this artist just looks at me and says, "What if to get my new album you just have to buy your friend an ice cream?" <laughs> And that blew my mind because that's, I mean, like, I, I sort of got it. And it's like, OK, you, you have the biggest house on this hill in Hollywood. You're, of course, you're at that point in your career where you just would like to see fans buying each other ice creams. But that's amazing. Like, the cultural interactions that, that might happen because content becomes a social object. And the more it's shared, the more something good can happen. That's really, really powerful. I'm, I'm a marketer. I'm thinking about money and emails. But artists are thinking about ice cream. So I can't wait to get this into the hands of people. Um, so yeah, the, the big idea is the more these are shared, the more value they create. And, and that's new. That's not something we've seen on the internet before. Oh, wait, I'm way over time. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up. But the, the big point of what we're trying to do at BitTorrent, um, and, oh, this is one more really good stat. So, Game of Thrones was downloaded 5.2 million times, which was lauded by the press as the record amount of downloads um, of, of something on BitTorrent ever. 
We actually beat that with a bundle, which got downloaded 8.6 million times. So we're already seeing these things work. They're already beating piracy at, at kind of its own game. This bundle wasn't just shared on our site. It was shared on the Pirate Bay. It was shared everywhere that pirated files are shared, because that's what bundles are designed to do. The, but the great thing is, this, this bundle from Epic Mealtime, which is a really good uh, cooking show, which involves lots of like bacon and crazy stuff, uh, you should check it out. The, the guys from Epic Mealtime were, were earning money and gaining fans with every single share of this bundle. So that's super cool. But this isn't about necessarily just the content industries. It's, I mean, we want to fix this right now because we see an opportunity. But really what we're trying to do as a company is, is think about the society that we build next. And, and this idea of things being distributed as being really, really important. So bundles is a way to democratize content distribution. Um, we have a new alpha, which is great, called Sync, which is a way to share all of your personal information between all of your machines, whether it's your phone or your laptop or whatever, with no servers at all. So think about Dropbox with no servers. If, no one, if there's no server, there's no cloud, then no one can look at your data except you. And that's kind of the idea of Sync. Um, and we've got another really, really cool technology, which you can check out on our, the lab section of bitsaron.com, which is BitTorrent Live, which is probably the most disruptive thing we've ever built. The way live works is it's um, live streaming based on the BitTorrent philosophy. So the audience is the power of the stream. The audience is the broadcast, which means the more people watching, the more powerful, more resilient the stream gets. The big problem with streaming is if too many people are watching something, it always breaks. Well, this would let 9 million people watch a stream from one phone coming out of Tahir Square, and it wouldn't break, and no government could shut it down. We actually did a beta test from Tahir Square at the weekend, and it held up perfectly. It was really, really incredible. So the thing I want to leave you with is just that this really is about what we do with information and how we think about it. And the decisions that we make now as a society, I mean, now, this year, 2013, will affect how our grandkids get to use information and the kind of societies that we have. So it, it's really important, and um, I, I think we should all think about it more. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here talking with you guys. Thank you.